Wisconsin has an abundance of artists across many disciplines, and we are excited to introduce you to a few of them. On this episode of the Arts Page, meet a sculptor whose traditional art moved into something much sweeter. Experience a visual artist combining sustainable technology with a demolition derby. See how spending time in a Wisconsin summer home influenced one landscape artist and get an inside look at iconic Wisconsin breweries through the beauty of one photographer's lens. That's all coming up on this edition of the Arts Page. Welcome to the Arts Page, I'm Sandy Max. You can find creativity and artistic beauty right here in Wisconsin, both in our nature and in our artists. In Port Washington, artist John Reichert made a living creating traditional pewter sculpture. However, the growth of his business led him to create art in a new and tasty direction. For John Reichert, pouring hot liquid into molds is all in a day's work. The pewter artist of today honed his sculpting skills in wood carving. Well, I started creating uh, when I was 27, 28 years old. Uh, I started doing large wood carvings to support my family. That's when I got married. Up until that point, I was just kind of mulling around the country and hitchhiking and not taking life seriously. And uh, from that point on, I supported my family uh, doing art. I've never really been employed outside of what I do. And it was becoming difficult uh, to survive doing the larger sculptures because they're so time and labor intense. So I had to come up with a method of uh, creating my art and making more money. So I looked into all different manufacturing processes and I found some used pewter equipment. And I paid off all the equipment with my first job. And it's been going great guns since. Reichert was attracted to pewter for its ease in manufacturing. And it, and it reproduces art very precisely and you know everything I sculpt comes through in the final product it's it's fun and I could get I could get jobs you know I get orders for 2,000 pieces 3,000 pieces so instead of doing one piece of art and getting paid uh, for one piece we would do multiples and we could make a living doing it in fact I am self-taught in all of my art so people in the pewter industry are very tight-lipped and nobody would give me any clues of how to do it so I had to learn I had to learn all of this on my own, so I had to learn how to design things so they'd pull, for, pull nicely from molds. I'd have to learn about the thickness of the pieces because if you, you know, if you make a piece too thick, it won't cast. You'll get porosity, which is pitting. So I had a lot of failures in the beginning, but I just stuck with it and I kept sculpting pieces until I uh, mastered it. With computer-assisted design, mold-making equipment, and a manufacturing process, Reichert was able to open a shop in downtown Port Washington. That led to an unusual expansion of the business. Well, I bought the building for my pewter business six years ago. And we had a retail space in front of the building. This used to be a title company. And in fact, this I built, the studio. I added this on. So we, Elizabeth, my wife, and I, thought for a year, well, what are we going to put in for retail? And we thought, well, chocolate's good. And I initially hired a chocolatier, and he couldn't keep up with our, our demand because we were selling a lot of chocolate. So then I started learning how to make chocolate. I taught myself. I come up with my own flavors and my own recipes. And now I have two chocolatiers that work for me. And, uh, and from the beginning, we thought, well, we could take our sculptures and, and put them into chocolate because it's the same process. It's all mold making. So now, then I bought a big, I bought a thermoforming machine, and we make our own chocolate molds, and we're starting to do uh, more and more of our unique pieces in chocolate. I can pretty much take anything I design and make it in chocolate. Uh, so it's, it's creative in both the sculpture and in the flavors and the types of chocolate we make. We get really creative with, with our ganaches and our chocolates. And we're making uh, chocolate from scratch now, from the raw ingredients and experimenting with that. And we're, and we're using different ratios of uh, sugars and we're doing some chocolates with stevia. It's, it's pretty creative. Anything that you can think of, you can flavor chocolate in. You know, whether, whether it's a, a lemon pepper or, or a lavender habanero, or, you know, we do a piece that, where we do a peanut butter ganache and a banana ganache and we call that the Elvis. 
because you like peanut butter and banana sandwiches. So it's, limit, you, it's limitless. In addition to pewter and chocolate, Reichert also dabbles in photography and making bronze sculptures and musical instruments. To see more of his pewter work, visit his website at reichertstudios.com. To experience the chocolate, you can stop in the store in downtown Port Washington or check out the website at chocolatechisel.com. Can science influence art? For Milwaukee artist Colin Mathis, a history at county fairs and exposure to alternative energy sparked an interest to combine these worlds. His desire to make art accessible turned into a fun, interactive, and thought-provoking display of destruction. I really like this idea of trying to jam together, combine, like using solar power with this, with the idea of a demolition derby and sort of making this like ecologically sustainable act of destruction. My name's Colin Mathis and I'm a visual artist working in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The title is Green Mini Demo Derby and what it is is it's a solar powered remote control car demolition derby. Ever since I was a young kid I grew up uh, installing solar electric at small town county fairs uh, with my father and so we always put in temporary electric and a couple years ago I went back to help him and he built this solar powered golf cart that was my work vehicle which was pretty amazing it was just one large solar panel and then it powered the golf cart where it was faster and super quiet compared to all other golf carts and never needed any maintenance. My favorite part of the fair every year is watching the demolition derby and you know, I like that people spend all this time and it becomes a super creative act to build something that you're just going to destroy in this like amazing, super fast spectacle. You could also think about it, Demolition Derby as being sort of ecologically ridiculous and it's sort of excessive. We have all these older cars that wouldn't pass emissions that just smash into each other and everything goes into the ground. So on one, maybe on like a mental level, you think, well, it's kind of stupid, but on a guttural level and then overall I'm just like, well, they're amazing. This project started basically as a series of long sketches and ideas and what actually made it possible to bring it into fruition was winning the Greater Milwaukee Foundation's Mary Noel Fellowship Fund for individual artists. Part of the award is that all the artists are invited to have an exhibition a year later at Innova where we are now and that's, that's what got the ball ro rolling really. The cars are hobby grade remote control cars. So I was pleasantly surprised that they're actually super fast and I had no idea about remote control cars before doing this. The bodies of remote control cars are actually super durable. And so I realized that I don't want that. And so I decided to hand build all the bodies out of Luan, which is a thin sort of cheap wood. What makes the cars green is that all the cars can be charged on a solar power station that is 100% renewable. It takes the cars uh, five to six hours to charge. The solar power station is actually much more overkill than we need, so it's, it doesn't take that much power to charge the cars, but we wanted to make something that would be robust enough to also be used, like say, at, at like a local farmer's market. You could run all your power off that or some sort of outdoor festival. They're all numbered here, so you, so you know which car is which. So you have to charge, you have to put, turn this on first, the remote, and then, and then turn on the car. All the cars are hand painted and, and they're painted with corporate logos which you could see is a relationship between racing or between um, and demolition derbies there's a lot of corporate sponsorship as well. So I wanted to involve uh, community sponsors within the project and four out of five people thought I was nuts but after a while I was able to get a little bit of uh, momentum and in the end I ended up having enough sponsorships to run two different heats and run 13 different cars in the derby. Uh, I am sponsoring the manga, Ape Girl Car, because I'm the director of the documentary uh, that is about uh, the Girl to Gorilla show in Brazil and the United States. I immediately wanted to sponsor it because I'm a fan of uh, demo derbies, I'm a fan of solar power, and um, I was very interested. I, I knew that I could race miniature cars. This is just like a dream come true. My name is Remy Camarina and I'm one of the sponsors with Colectivo Coffee. The fact that it has a green component kind of aligns itself really well 
with Colectivo as a company. Being supportive of the arts, being supportive of green projects, um, it just it sounded like a good fit for us and fun. So yeah, we we're happy to be a part of it. You know, the, the companies that would be interested are ones that have um, interest in creating this more ethical business model or at least a community-based business model. I'm inviting them to participate in this sort of this game of survival of the fittest or of self-interest and then um, so then they so basically they get to participate in this like corporate death match that's under a cloak of sustainability. The most popular sponsorship was an individual uh, race team sponsorship where by doing that you get your own hand-painted car to race in the derby and you have your own jumpsuit uniform and then you can provide your own driver which I think every sponsor took me up on that. These are like remote control cars, so I will drive it and smash the car against the other cars and you can see how powerful my car is, so it will obviously win the race. <laughs> oh, Colin gave us some options. Uh, if you, you could choose whether the car was going to be like a low ride or like a big car. We actually have a Colectivo bus that is kind of the mascot of our company. Um, and that bus is painted in these colors, so that's how we chose the, the red and the turquoise color. Then 93 was the year that our company was born. What I'm the most excited about uh, being part of this project is winning and destroying all the other cars. It's a demolition derby, so the concept's actually really simple. You take all the cars, you put them on the track, and then they start, and then you just smash into each other till there's one left. The cars stay as part of the exhibit. It felt like you were at a sporting event or something, so that was, I think that was good. It, it did feel like it either wasn't art or it was more fun than regular art or something. <laughs> I think being tied to a little bit more of a personal, individual project, especially something that carries our name with it, has been a really fun experience. I think the main point is to support local artists and people that do things themselves and have original ideas. What makes art visual art is the intention. What's important to me is that it's a whole lot of fun and it becomes this like fantastic spectacle. Yeah, if you let it, let it sit and just hit reverse a couple of times, it might work. I think the goal would be to have it feel like it's very accessible as an art project and feel like almost anyone can really enjoy it or people who don't want to enjoy it sort of forget that and they end up, like despite themselves, they end up being interested or end up having fun. The destroyed mini demolition derby cars were displayed at the Innova Gallery here in Milwaukee. To see who won the green mini demolition derby, check out greenminidemoderby.tumblr.com. To learn more about Mathis's upcoming projects, visit his website at colinmathis.com. Wisconsin's natural beauty can be seen across the state. For artist Arnold Alanis, having a vacation home in Door County, Wisconsin, allows him to capture landscapes and gardens through careful composition and fine detail. I like to keep the background coming through the front so it isn't so solid. Hence, I leave some spaces in between. He's known for his delicate landscapes of Wisconsin's North Woods, but Arnold Alanese grew up under the hot Texas sun, miles away from what has become his favorite subject. When I grew up, uh, it was in South Texas, along the Gulf Coast, and my idea of landscape were sand dunes, cactus, palm trees. When I received a scholarship to come to Madison to attend the University of Wisconsin, I came face to face with maple trees and oaks and beautiful foliage that changed color in the fall. I saw snow and trees that, evergreens, that we only had at Christmas. They were cut down and decorated with, you know, lights and ornaments, but here they were in the, in the wild. I, I was so impressed to, that I think to this day, I still paint those images because of that wonderful change of season and color and uh, 
the woods. I had no woods where I lived. There was scrub grass and mesquite. These are just the preliminary undertones to the piece. It's going to change dramatically over time. But I'm creating the atmospheric look to it, the, the softness of the background. It has to go from the very beginning. It's just something you just don't put on in one coat. My pieces are inspired by life, by scenes that I see. Especially lately, I've been doing long walks in the woods and in some of the parks here in Door County and coming upon scenes that I normally would never have seen. And those have kind of found their way into my work. Uh, I work primarily in the studio, even though I get ideas from nature, I'm a studio artist. Uh, my work is a combination of uh, large, broad areas of color and, and detail, and mostly detail. And those are hard to do in the field, so I don't really consider myself a plain air painter as such. Alanese is known for his landscapes with their soft, gentle treatment of light and subtle gradations of colors. The large, flat areas of color take the longest because they're layers upon layers, one over the other, and they have to dry. I work with acrylic, and because of that, the layer that lays on top of the one below becomes transparent. You can see the colors coming through if you work it thin enough, so it, it gives you the, the glow, the that atmospheric look that is so prevalent in my work. That's the hardest, to lay down the tones. And then, of course, the detail, which many people think is the hardest, but to me, I enjoy that. It's like therapy. <laughs> That's the part that takes the longest, the, uh, the building of the tone and the branches, et cetera, and you know, the, the little details, the leaves. Alanese drew his inspiration from artists of another time. I think some of the strongest influences during my uh, education were in the work of the Hudson River School artists and also the work of the French Impressionists for their colors. Uh, I think some of the landscapes of Turner and some of the uh, School of Impressionism made strong impressions on me even though I wasn't aware of it at the time and uh, I think perhaps those are some of the strongest influences. Not so much artists living in my time. Uh, my work is somewhat romantic, and when I was in school, that wasn't the end thing to be painting. But I survived it, and I you know, came out doing the same thing I love to do and making a go of it. For Alanese, each work is a delicate blending of realism, romanticism, and impressionism that reveals the tranquil, reflective side of nature. I've always tried to convey the feeling of awe and kind of, oh, solitude that I get in the scenes that I paint. So they're the all-inspiring thing to me, and I use my technique to meet those ends. So I'd have to say it's the scene itself or the image. If it has a message, it's to make people stop and look at the everyday things we take for granted. Scenes that I paint are not necessarily sensational or extraordinary. They're very mundane in their own way, but yet the way I present them gives them a certain importance, a certain majesty. Even the simplest trees have a certain dignity about them that I think uh, is inherent. And it makes people say, oh wow, you know, look at what I see every day and appreciate it more. And that's my, part of my message in my work. Alanese's unique, original, award-winning paintings can be seen up close in his gallery and studio in Ellison Bay, Wisconsin from May through October. To get a peek online, visit his website at alaneseart.com. It's easy to appreciate the beauty in Wisconsin's many natural wonders, but for Economawak photographer Paul Bialis, he drew inspiration from the details of iconic Wisconsin breweries that were decaying before his eyes. I'm looking for the signs of life that still exist and to share them with everyone. Everyone can kind of get a feel for what, what it was like to work here and what it was like to be part of this amazing place. You wonder what's in there. You know, you drive by an abandoned building and you want to know 
I wonder what's inside there, and then take an amazing place with a lot of history, like the Pabst or Schlitz. Who wouldn't want to see what's in there? My name is Paul Bialis, and I am a photographer. Um, it's, it's a hobby, but it's really growing and uh, continues to get bigger and bigger. I really enjoy it. About four years ago now, uh, I was driving through Milwaukee and found these buildings downtown here, at the Pabst Brewery. The buildings are amazing, and that became my first project. And took a lot of pictures down here, and it, it, it turned into something I felt I really had to share, and it turned into a book. I wanted it to sit on my coffee table at home and, and let people enjoy it. And then somebody else said, well, I'd like a book, and then another person. And as all of a sudden 100 people wanted books, I started spending more time making the book because more people were going to see it. Well, the first thing was the pap sign and the look of the buildings. I mean, because it's, it's the stained, Cream City bricks that are outside of them and they're all dark now. It, it just felt like you're in the early 1900s, late 1800s and there's no place else you can get that feeling. Once I had taken a lot outside, had some great photos, I had, had to get inside. I really wanted to know what was in there. And when I got in, what I saw was amazing. I felt like an investigator. I'm trying to find things in these photos that bring to life these buildings, the employees, the stories they told. So a lot of the images you'll see are the, uh, maybe it's a pep sticker on something or you know an employee. There's one of them where there's a, you know, like the employee of the month or it's like an overtime hour sheet. There, there are a lot of rooms that are, that kind of appear just as when the workers left. And, uh, the break room image is probably my favorite in the Pabst book. We have the lockers. I love that this one has her name on it, Esther. This is Esther's locker. Louise is over there. All the signage on the lockers here from the employees. You know, one element on the table there was or is a Harnish Baker ice cube tray. There's an empty pack of cigarettes on the table, a Pabst bottle, there's a steak escape mug. Um, there's a calendar in the corner that says 1985 on it still. Here, look at, there's still things in the lockers over here. We want to tell the, the story of the employees, so how can we do that? You know, by looking at, taking the picture including the table and including the lockers, and it's going to tell the story of the workers, their break time. I mean, it's just as they left it when they walked out. That's part of the reason I did the whole project. I, n I never got to take a tour through the Pabst Brewery and being able to kind of get a feeling for what the workers were like. That's something I strive for in the book, telling the story of, of the people of Paps that you know, we don't have anymore. Paul came here, I think, just uh, curious as a, a customer in our gift shop, and uh, as he said, just fell in love with the buildings and was surprised to see that there was one open and came in one day. And he's such a, a likable guy. We quickly hit off a friendship. And then he mentioned that he'd love to take photographs. And I was sort of surprised, because I thought he'd be taking ornate pictures of some of the most beautiful spaces. And was quite surprised to see almost the exact opposite of him looking for the worst peeling paint, the worst situations. And I started to say, well, gee, I thought this was going to be about the beauty of the place. But uh, I came to see the beauty in capturing those peeling paint type pictures. The infirmary is like something out of a horror movie. And uh, that's a really neat place. And you see these old drapes and they still say Pabst on them. And the bed is old and you know there's broken tiles on the floor. And it, to me it was just an amazing place to stand. And that was just walking into that room for the first time and seeing what was there. and what could be saved on film, and the story it told, to me, was an amazing, amazing thing. And when I finished Pabst, a historian contacted me and said, I can get you access into the Schlitz Brewhouse, which is set to be demolished any month now, kind of take it or leave it. And I thought, this is perfect, you know, it, it fits so well. So I dropped everything I was doing, grabbed the camera, went down and started shooting. The same feeling, you walk in and it's just this giant open area 
And what was amazing about it is I'm walking up the steps of this just amazing building and, and you're taking in all the history and it's just silent, you know, you're the only one there. And when you get up to the top, there's this huge American flag hanging over in the brew house. It was good to see it be photographed and, and uh, uh, the way Paul did it. Uh, you could actually smell the beer in, in some of these pictures, pick up the aroma. And it, the pictures do say a lot. And I'm very proud of what he's done. One photo is a picture of the brew house looking up at the skylight. The skylight was a very important aspect of the architectural history of that, that brew house, as it was with most buildings built in that era. The skylight was still intact at the time Paul took these pictures. Another thing that, that stood out was the ornate ironwork of the steps. It was a multi-level building, and it was the ornate ironwork that really set this building apart from most other buildings built in that era. I remember just sitting down, you know, both in the Pabst Brew House and the Schlitz Brew House, and you kind of just, just sitting in, in the quiet, giant room, and you kind of just take it all in, and it's just a wonderful feeling. I hope that, you know, they get a feeling of how great these breweries were in Milwaukee and what it was like during that time period when these were the, you know, the largest breweries in the world and you couldn't go to a dinner or, or not know someone who didn't work for the brewery. And what was that like? You know, what was this time period like? What were the breweries like? As, you know, another takeaway is like the ornateness of the buildings, you know, as you'll see in the photographs. Think of the late 1800s, you know, our forefathers, what did they, how did they build? You know, when they built something, it was going to last a thousand years and there was going to be decorative, stylative things put in all of it in intricacy. And this book, both books, preserve that. Both of Bialis's books about Pabst and Schlitz include rare brewery collectibles, such as original labels, while supplies last, and each one is autographed by the author. To get a copy of these books or to learn more about Bialis's other photography, visit his website at lakecountryphoto.com. For more information on this week's features, visit our website at mptv.org and click on the arts page or like us on Facebook at The Arts Page. On the next edition of The Arts Page, we explore artistic insight. Meet a local artist whose wearable art is inspired by plastic bags. See a surrealist painter's unique way of portraying a face. And listen as a composer brings life to silent films. I'm Sandy Max, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next edition of The Arts Page.